Hey guys, welcome back. Today I'm going to be answering some questions that you guys asked me over on my Instagram. Heads up, there is a little dog under the table who likes to make noise occasionally when playing with his ball or just walking around or just being a dog. So if you hear any funny noises, it's probably him. <clears throat> so the first question I have is from S. Wood 1745. When you buy horses, what do you look for? Um, this is a pretty complicated one. I feel like that's a whole video within itself, but to summarize it, I guess. The number one thing I look for is obviously soundness. Um, we compete in a very demanding sport, so that's something to take into consideration that the horse is gonna hold up to the work that we expect of it. Um, number two is definitely sanity. Um, if you don't have a horse that is willing to work with you and has the brain to be able to compete and is trainable, you're not gonna get very far or it's gonna take you a long time to get where you want to, want to be. So. Um, that's definitely number two. Number three is confirmation. So good thing or things like a good shoulder, a strong set shoulder, um, low stifle, a short pastor and good feet, that kind of stuff, which again, I'll go into that in depth in another video because that's probably pretty hard for you guys to picture. Um, that's another one. And then the fourth one, my last one is athleticism. So quality of gait, um, just kind of their athletic ability, which sometimes you can see from with thoroughbreds just in a gallop video, or if you meet them in person, um, you can kind of see that too. So again, I'll go into depth on another video with that. Next question, Emma J asks, are you in college? Have you graduated? What are you going for? What degree do you have? Um, yes, I went to college from when I was 17 until I was 21. I actually graduated high school early. I have multiple um, associate's degrees, so I have AAs in liberal arts, math and science, liberal arts, humanities. Um, I also, I was going for biology, I was going to become a veterinarian, but when the training kind of ended up working out, um, I decided to take that route instead. So I do have my undergraduate done, and I am shy in my biology degree by one class, as well as chemistry. So. There's always the option to go back if I wanted to do that, but for now I had to kind of take the leap of faith and go after the training since it was working out and um, best decision I think I've ever made. But go to school kids, go to school. <laughs> Summer Noon 12 asks or says, tell us about your start in riding. Were you a natural or were you a nervous beginner? Did you spend a lot of time on lessons or did you work off your lessons at the barn? What made you get into horses? You're an amazing rider trainer, and I'm sure we would all love to hear your backstory. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's very sweet. Um, <clears throat> so I started riding when I was 11. I actually got into riding because one of my friends was getting into it. My mom rode when she was younger, but before I was 11, the most I'd had was like an occasional ride at the state fair on a pony. Um, but yeah, I started taking lessons when I was 11. I, I don't know if I was necessarily a natural. I was doing flat for a long time. I felt like I was stuck at two foot for years and years and years and years. Um, but I wouldn't say I was nervous. I'm, I've been pretty gung-ho with everything I do in life. I'm just, it's kind of how I am. I guess I'm just kind of like a go-getter. Um, but it was definitely a humbling experience. I remember my first fall was a good shot to the confidence, but um, you know, I think it, it toughens you up and it teaches you always get back on and it makes makes you push on a little harder. And did I work off lessons? Actually, yes, I did work off lessons. So my parents and I, my parents have always been really good in teaching me work ethic. So whenever I had Christmas money, I had to save up and take lessons or birthday money, anything like that, or I'd do chores to get paid. And I always paid half of my lessons growing up, even when I was 11. And, um, when I was 18, even when I, you know, bought Roman when I was 19, I was 100% mine. I've always paid all my own board and uh, worked at a restaurant to pay off a lot of my horses in my teenage years. So, yeah, a lot of working. 
Rebecca M. Jordan asks, how to perfect your position and specifically how to fix your back rolling over larger jumps? So with position and um, just jumping in general, you need a lot of core strength. So I think any sort of uh, cross training that you can do to strengthen your core or even like no stirrups work, it really helps in strengthening your position. Also grid work, bounces, holding your two point, um, it'll get you a lot stronger back but I really just try to think of really like stiff, strict angles, kind of when I'm jumping, like a, like a stick almost through your back and your leg to your heel. Playing it B R A B. I'm sorry if I said that wrong, asked which horse has been the most challenging and why, and which horse has been the most re rewarding to you? That's pretty hard because I feel like each horse is very rewarding in its own way. Um, but I actually think the answer to this is the same horse. So Troy has obviously been extremely rewarding seeing from um, <clears throat> how emaciated he was and how little he knew and just kind of where he came from, from the neglect and the abuse. And he's also been the most challenging because he was so fearful, but also really hot and also a little unpredictable and pretty spooky. And um, he actually was not very talented jumping to start. Every single like pull or cross rail that I put up he would literally trot over it like he didn't understand that all of his feet had to leave the ground at one point um but more so just his behavior it's been really rewarding to see him come out of his shell and um like trust people and just <laughs> i don't know he's he's a crack up but even just seeing like his demeanor change has been pretty crazy rebecca m jordan asks second question good job um what are your long-term goals? I could see you being a Grand Prix rider. Thank you, <laughs> that's a huge compliment. Um, my long-term goals, I don't know, it's funny. One of uh, the people I used to work for asked me about like my 10-year goals, and I had a really hard time answering that, mainly because I think my longer-term goals have been met in the shorter term. So when I was a kid, all I really wanted was to be able to walk down a barn aisle filled with thoroughbreds and be able to ride and train all the horses in the barn, which is really funny to think about now. Um, but as far as Grand Prix riding and stuff, I, I don't know. I mean, I like showing. I don't love showing. I'm, I'm a competitive person, but it's not necessarily something that I thrive and like love doing. Um, and Grand Prix riders, it takes a lot of money to get there. And I think for me personally, I more so do this because I love the horses, not as much for like going and competing and winning a ribbon, if that makes sense. So as much as it would be amazing to jump those classes someday, that's not necessarily like my end goal. I think my end goal is just to kind of keep advocating for thoroughbreds and yeah. <laughs> Katie... Blanche1234 asks, what is your biggest riding strength and weakness? This is so hard because I'm, I'm, I don't really like to talk about uh, personally my strengths, but weaknesses, your girl has a few. So I'm one of those people I like to pick my riding apart. Um, very frequently I see myself breaking my wrist or having what I call chicken wing elbows where like my elbows are like out to the side kind of crazy. Um, also, sometimes my knee opens over the fence, which is a pet peeve of mine. Um, sometimes I sit up a little too soon. We're all not perfect, but um, I think being aware of your weaknesses is really good so that you can constantly work on them. Strength, I think, um, again, this is kind of hard for me. Strength, I know a lot of people comment on the lower leg and heel. Sometimes my heel is too deep where it's almost ineffective, so I don't know with that. But I do take pride in being able to get on a lot of different horses and be able to figure them out. Um, I thank Foxfield for that because I sat on so many different horses growing up that um, I feel like they gave me a really strong repertoire as far as like being able to ride a lot of different things. Soya Bean Equestrian asks, do you ice all of your horses after riding? So I ice horses that either one have had an injury prior so as some of you know d has had a very minor 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 suspensory strain um he compacted part of his sesamoid last year he has quite a few splints um he also is just one he's very 
wind puff e so he gets like some lymphatic swelling um, that's cosmetic but from the track he's just a little a little extra fluid filled sometimes so i ice him um, always after i jump sometimes after a hard work flatting for most of my horses if they don't have an injury prior that um you know just just preventative i'll ice them if it's either a long strenuous work or if it's jumping over three feet. So that's kind of my rule, just because I have limited ice wraps and I ride a lot of horses in the day, so I wanna make sure I'm using them where it really counts. TCF Eventing asks, favorite equestrian sport other than hunters or jumpers? I feel like if I wasn't a hunter or jumper, I do really like dressage, a lot of my foundations in dressage, I would probably be a barrel racer or a rainer because I think that would be fun. Not sure though. Tess Coffrey asks, have you ever competed in eventing? No. I would love to, but I'm kind of a chicken. So, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Heidi McAlpine Equine, again, sorry if I said this wrong. If you could compete at any competition, what would it be? Hmm. I don't know, I think WEF would be really cool, or WEG. Um, I really like San Juan Capistrano, like the Oaks is really cool. But yeah, I don't know, that's a hard one. Hannah Smith asks a lot of questions. Best half pad with back risers, gaining confidence when jumping the rider, best core exercise, riding or not, advice with COPD horses. Okay, let's start on the first one. Best half pad with back risers. Um, so I use a ton of different half pads. I love my Eco Gold half pad, but it does not have back risers. Magic has a pretty good one that has shims um, that you can insert. I'm a like live and die fan of thin lines. I think they're great if you have the correct style of it. Gaining confidence while jumping the rider. I would do a lot of pole work. Um, coursing poles is really good because you kind of get in a rhythm and you feel Confident. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, I guess I have a lap dog now. You're done. You're fired. Get out of here. Get your ball. Get your ball. Get your ball. <clears throat> okay. Back to gaining confidence when jumping the rider. Yeah, pole work is great. Um, grid work is really awesome too. I think like a line of bounces or like a bounce to a one stride if you're um, getting to kind of a new height and the horse has been there but you haven't. A really great way is to kind of work it up with the grid so that you get used to kind of seeing that height before, you know, just full blown diving into a course. Um, or, you know, if you ride a line, like let's say a five stride, you ride a five stride really well at one height and then you leave the first one a little smaller and you put the back one up to, you know, up a hole or two. Um, you ride it exactly the same. That's like a really good way to kind of get used to seeing a little bigger height. Um, but more than anything, I always just try to stay as optimistic as possible. So even though you had like a, bi a bad ride yesterday, or maybe you came off or something like that, always just try to give it the benefit of the doubt, even when it's hard. Best core exercises, riding or not. Um, I'm a firm believer in no straps work. I think it's great for your balance, for your leg strength, for your core strength, all of it. Um, that being said, I also think grid work is awesome you know like take your stirrups off and do three bounces which is why i have a t-shirt i'm not ashamed of this plug um grid work makes the dream work because it's true um yeah so i really like that the last part is advice with copd horses i have very limited experience with copd horses so i would say um i'll have to get back to you on that one gabby van asks have you ever had a horse that was aggressive towards humans at first? How do you fix that? So I had a horse named Caspian um, oh, quite a while ago. And before I got him, he was out in a paddock for nine months to a year. I don't really know how long. And he was with some other horses. He got extremely food aggressive. He was extremely underweight when I got him. And he was just pretty aggressive in general. If you turned him out in um, the arena, and you had like a whip trying to get him to just kind of like, you know, work at liberty or no whip. If you just have like a lead rope or anything, he would charge you. I did a lot of round pinning work with him, a lot of ground work, a lot of yielding the haunches. Any single time that he would um, 
get tense, defensive, aggressive, I would yield his haunches um, or back him up. But again, I did a lot of groundwork with this horse and a lot of ground pinning work. The food aggressiveness, it slowly went away. The biggest thing with aggressive horses, I think, is people often overcorrect them to make the aggression worse. So you never want to fight fire with fire. Um, if you have a horse that is aggressive towards you while eating food and you come at them aggressive as well It's only going to elevate the situation So a lot of the time if I even get a young horse that comes in that when I give it its bucket it pins its ears at me I just ignore it. Don't make a big deal out of it. As long as they're respectful Normally in a couple months they learn this lady actually feeds me food. She doesn't take my food and 99% of the time with my young horses it goes away if it is past that stage, that's when I would definitely go back to ground work and, and find someone who specializes in behavior. Jay Bird Run asks, do you follow any kind of exercise and diet regimen besides riding horses all day long? Um, no. <laughs> I eat a really big dinner, which is probably not good. And then I normally eat a pretty small breakfast if I eat breakfast, uh, a snack through the day and I ride a lot of horses. Drink lots of water. Don't drink coffee. Yeah. Charlie B. Eck asks, would you ever consider starting a wild Mustang or a horse other than an OTTBs? Also, how did you grow your Insta? Was it intentional, etc." Um, so the first part, would you ever consider starting a wild Mustang? Yes, I have considered that many times. Um, I almost did the Mustang makeover in 2018, but uh, it's hard because there's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot of time that goes into gentling mustangs, like hours and hours on end of repetition, you know, a little in the morning, a little in the afternoon, a little in the evening. And even though I've trained three different mustangs, um, it hasn't been from scratch. And it would be fun, but it's really time consuming. Um, also, I'm in California, so I think if I was closer to one of the makeover places themselves, like Nevada, um, they have one, Oklahoma, I think they have one. You should probably know that. Um, but if I was in Nevada, I think it would be easier because then trailering to the makeover is really close instead of like hours and hours away. But yeah, I would definitely do that. I have broken, broke other horses other than thoroughbreds from start. So it's fun. It's just, it's kind of a risk too. Um, they are wild horses. And even though we can go by the book and train them step by step, they are unpredictable. And at this point in my career, I think I'm going to put it on pause just because I have so many horses going I don't truly have the time that I think would be fair to the horse. How did you grow your Instagram? Was it intentional? I didn't really do anything. Roman was a really special thoroughbred. I've never seen another thoroughbred or really another horse jump quite like him. Um, his story I think was kind of, um, I don't know, it's very unique especially with him breaking his leg. A lot of people I think followed that journey and watched him kind of come out the other side and it was a blessing um, that he healed the way he did and I think a lot of people really like to follow that but it was not intentional at all it just kind of started happening when I first got Roman and then after he broke his leg it continued to grow and then since then with the other training horses it's it's grown further but it wasn't intentional um, I do get a lot of questions about this and I think my number one piece of advice would be like just be active you know like people's pictures always be positive um, you know post post a lot <laughs> I guess um, but yeah destiny da04 asked I've previously used ranitidine to treat ulcers in my OTTB however now it is discontinued do you have any other recommendations for cost-effective ulcer treatments? So this is a hard one. Ranitidine, technically you can still find it on Valley Vet. You do need a prescription, um, at least last time I checked. I personally wouldn't treat with ranitidine. I would treat with omeprazole. So you can get compounded omeprazole. There are a lot of varying um, reviews on if it actually works. Otherwise, um, abler.com, they do little like packets of omeprazole that you can use, which we're trying that on Remington, so we'll see kind of how well it works. Um, but I have had really good success on racehorsemeds.com. They have syringes that are compounded, and I think they're $16.99. Um, 2.83 grams of omeprazole per tube. They do have some with sulfurphate in it as well, which is for hind gut ulcers. And I've had really good success with that. I treated D for 45 days with those, and it worked. 
So um, it's about half the price, but at the same time, due to what's um, actually in it, you can get the full tube of Ulcer Guard, which has four doses in it for $36.99 or something like that. Or you can use either a half or full tube at $16.99. So it comes out to be pretty similar. Um, I think when it comes to ulcers, you kind of just have to go with name brand. Um, it works the best. And if your horse is insured, it is covered by insurance. So I do use some preventative stuff. Um, I feed Daily Gold, Equine, and Gastroplex from MVP. So I have those in my Amazon store if you guys want to check out. The link is down below. But that's what I feed as well as um, Alamend by Vitalize is another really good one to ease stomach discomfort. So if you're looking at a horse that has had problems in the past or you're trying to avoid problems in the future, I recommend using something like that. A Monasterial asks, what are your plans for Griffin? That's a good question. <laughs> so let's kind of go back on the Griffin thing. Griffin came in as a client horse and his his owner wanted something um, that was like really rock solid, safe, easy, fun, um, just really mellow. And Griffin, even though he is, to me, all of those things, he is, you know, a little bit more forward and he's a higher caliber horse. So he's really talented, he's a go-getter. Um, and he's like a, a strong muscular ride. You know, he feels like a Grand Prix horse when you ride him. He doesn't feel like, you know, a trail horse. And so she was having kind of a discrepancy as if like she wanted to see if she wanted to keep him or if she wanted to find something that was a little more like her speed, especially since she's looking at potentially having a baby in the next few years. Um, so I took him over because I thought he was really talented and I didn't want to see him go anywhere yet. Um, for me, he's not my typical kind of ride. I like really hot, catty, quick, um, kind of Ferrari-esque. And he's really, he would be a phenomenal equitation horse. Phenomenal. And so he will be for sale um, because I just, you know, he's not really my typical ride. That being said, I think he's probably one of the most talented horses I have in the barn right now. So it's really cool to have him part of the herd, even for the time being. Keeping up with Khan. Is D a descendant of Secretariat? Yes, Secretariat is his granddaddy on his sire's side. So, yeah, he's got the wide shoulders and the big nostrils, just like Secretariat. Okay. Ali Kroon one asks, what is the best advice someone had given you and what would your advice be for anyone? So I don't know if this is advice, but someone I used to work for, um, a Grand Prix writer, said, one day we were like hacking out and he said, um, I could write a whole book about what I know about horses, but I would need a whole library to fill what I don't know. And I think that's really true. So like my advice, I guess, would be like never stop learning. Um, even though, you know, I have so many horses, like the horses teach me so much just on the day to day. So that's really rewarding. And um, you're never too old to learn. And the horses are never too old to learn either. So I think that's, that's good advice. Anna Equine asked, what is your biggest horse pet peeve? cannot stand when a horse <laughs> cannot walk beside you. Like when they walk faster than you, that's like up there. Maybe also standing at the mounting block when they walk away, that's up there too. And pawing, oof, pawing is a big one too. Flying with Maximus asks, would you recommend making a career out of horseback riding? I think that's a hard one. I know a lot of people think it's really amazing to be a trainer, you know, like when I was growing up, and it is, it is, it is. But um, growing up, you know, I was like, oh, it's gonna be so much fun. I just get to ride horses all day, every day. There's a lot more to that. Um, it's a really long day. You're looking at like 12 hours a day, realistically. And the work never stops when you go home. You know, like, especially with clientele, they'll text you anywhere from, you know, right when you get home to two o'clock in the morning. And you have to be kind of on call all the time, going to the grain store after you've been working all day and loading like 800 pounds of grain in the back of your truck or hay or whatever it is. Um, you know, and also being on call for all of the horses that you have in training. You know, you're like their, one of their guardians, so to speak. So their health and safety also relies upon you. Um, that being said, I absolutely love what I do, but I think it takes a very specific person to have the motivation and the determination to keep going every day and still love what you do and not look at it like a job. So another thing to take into consideration is because I work such crazy hours. I'm at the barn every single day. I work six days a week. I used to work seven days a week, but I work six days a week. Sunday, I take a half day. 
um, cause I feed in the morning and do whatever I need to do. But because of that, I miss out on a lot of things. Um, weddings, vacations, social life. It's really hard for me to get away for more than like two days at a time because there are so many horses that rely on me. So, um, that's another thing to take into consideration is if you're willing to make sacrifices like that, because, um, that's kind of what the career path entails. Another two, where would you see yourself in 10 years? Mm. More therapists. <laughs> Reminisce Equestrian asks, who has been your favorite horse to work with so far in your career? I have so many different ones for different reasons, but I think probably my favorite, it's kind of a tie between Tommy um, this horse that I had at Foxfield and D. D reminds me so much of Tommy, but D and I have been through a lot. Um, he was one of like the founding horses in my training. I credit a lot of the success I've had due to him purely because he was, he was kind of the beginning. He was one of my first client horses. Um, yeah, he's probably one of my favorite. And he rides a lot like a Ferrari. He's a very easy ride on the flat like he's so fun he's such a schoolmaster knows his job whenever you get on him he's got the blinders on like nose to the grindstone ready to work you put him in the show ring he's like a professional he just gets in there and knows that like it's game time tommy was like that too boo radley the basset asks how did you afford everything when you first started out how can someone get sponsored financially this is not a cheap sport so any tips to share for those who do not have endless income resources is greatly appreciated so when i first started out i kind of mentioned this before um, i paid for a lot of my lessons at least half myself if not you know fully fully out of my own pocket um, i did a lot of chores did a lot of extra things but you know like i said i had another job i only rode a few times a week for quite a few years and how can someone get sponsored? So with me, I think it's more so due to the social media influence, you know, having like a, a larger following, but also um, a big thing is being positive. Always be a positive person, always do your best to support others and make yourself as a positive influencer. Um, I've seen a lot of times when, when things happen on the internet and people will get negative or hateful and sponsors will actually drop them due to it. So I think it's big to always be positive, always be the best you can be. Financially, this is not a cheap sport. Yeah, so um, for the last part of this question, I think, you know, I used to buy a lot of things secondhand. So I'd, you know, go on eBay or I'd go to yard sales and my mom would give me like old polo shirts from when she would golf and stuff. And I wore those for a long time. I had like four pairs of breeches for the longest time. I'd wear old men's belt that I'd punch holes in because it was thicker than women's belts. Um, Hand-me-down boots, that kind of stuff. But um, I think, you know, the biggest part, it's not so much how much the breeches are that you're wearing or how much the boots are or how expensive your shirt was or if it's name brand or not. Um, it's more so your love for the sport and, and again, being positive. So those things will come. Just stay, stay determined, keep doing great. Elizabeth Chap, Elizabeth C. Chap asks, how often do you usually compete when COVID isn't an issue and how many of your horses do you take to each show? I would say maybe like once every six weeks on average. I think we normally go to like eight horse shows a year. Sometimes 10. It also kind of depends where the horses are. So um, for a couple different years, like 2015, 2016, with Roman breaking his leg, or 2016, 2017, I didn't go to nearly as many shows. One, because it's expensive and it's hard for me to justify spending that kind of money for a ribbon sometimes. That sounds kind of shallow, but again, it's not my favorite thing to do. I would much rather, um, watch a young horse develop at home than go to a horse show to get a ribbon. Um, but yeah, about every six weeks. And then how many of your horses do you take to each show? I think the least amount of horses that we've taken to a show in the last few years is three. And the most is six because that's what our trailer can fit. So I ideally don't like to be on more than four horses in one show. Um, the Thoroughbred Classic this last year in December, I was riding six horses all weekend which was 
really crazy because I had six horses every single day plus warm ups and two classes each horse. So I was doing like around 17 rounds each day and having, I didn't have a groom. I had someone helping me and my mom and a couple of the owners stopped in, but it was literally me running around completely chaotic, trying to groom horses and tack them up and get in the arena by the time I'm supposed to go. So I don't like to be on more than like three or four horses per show. It just gets too crazy. Stephanie CC 397 asks for your three Zen Troy D what brand of saddles do you use? Love the bit and feeding episode. Thank you. Glad you like them. Um, I use CWDs and D has his own saddle. It is custom fit to him. That being said, I do use it on, um, I think two other horses right now that are also kind of wide, but Zin and Troy have their own saddle. It's not custom fit to either one of them. Most likely in the next year, I'll probably get Troy's, that saddle custom fit to Troy and I'll get another saddle custom fit to Zin. Uh, like I said, they're all CWDs, two GSs. Callie has her own saddle as well. Roman has his own. Um, I absolutely love them. The 2GS fits me better than like any saddle I think I've ever sat in before. And I have a very interesting leg type. So that's what works best for me. I am very thankful to be partnered with CWD. Um, they're absolutely amazing people. I've always loved their company and I feel extremely blessed to be able to um, say that I'm sponsored by them and working with them. Becca Nowak, sorry if I, post, I said that wrong, asked, what do you like to do outside of riding horses? I don't remember the last time I did anything other than ride horses. Um, I like a lot of things. So something that probably a lot of people don't know about me is I was a competitive surfer growing up um, as well. I also uh, played piano, got my certificate in piano theory which I can't say I enjoyed as much as I enjoyed surfing, but that's okay. Um, but I also like fishing and camping, outdoor stuff in general. Anything that really, I don't know, that is outside is good. Double Diamond Magic asked, what is your typical writing schedule? So I have a couple barn blogs posted. Feel free to check those out if you haven't already. Um, it kind of depends on the client and horses. So. I have a general rule of thumb is however many years old the horse is after three years old is how many days maximum the horse should be working. So if it's a three-year-old, I'll never ride it more than three days a week. If it's a four-year-old, I'll never ride it more than four days a week. Five-year-old, five days a week. Six-year-old, then we can start hitting six days a week. Um, that is not inclusive of turnout. So turnout, I think horses should be turned out every day if they can, um, if your facility and weather permits it. Um, but yeah, my, my schedule kind of depends on what the client has. So some people have their horse in four days a week, so I'll pencil it in for four different days a week. Um, I try to spread it out, obviously, over the week. But none of my horses jump more than twice a week. And yeah. But I'm probably going to do a video in the future because I've had a lot of questions about um, formulating a schedule for your horse. So I'll probably do something short and sweet about uh, kind of how I work my schedule in through the week for a new horse that comes in or something like that. And the last question is from Bailey's Eck. Are you the head slash only trainer at your barn? At Willow Creek? Yes, I am the only trainer at Willow Creek. I've had different trainers come in and service different people if they're Western or dressage or stuff like that, um, that I either one, don't have time for or don't have the training on because I'm no Western trainer. Um, but yeah, there are other trainers that service it, but I'm the head trainer. I am based out of there and it's only my clientele mainly that's that's there so yeah thank you guys so much for watching this video um, I hope I answered some of your guys questions again if you ever have any other questions feel free to leave them in the comments below or DM me on Instagram comment on Instagram and I'll do my best to answer those as well